two. One. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another exciting film journey here on Inside Movies Galore. I am one of your hosts, and today we are going on a, 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 about a film brought to us by our good friend, Jake. Jake, why don't you tell us a little bit about the uh, film that you, uh, you ch uh, chose for, uh, for uh, today's episode? Okay, well, um, I am going to choose something a little off uh, the beaten path for what people probably expect from me. Uh, it is a film from 2009, uh, directed by Kyle Newman and called Fanboy. Um, and if, uh, <clears throat> as the poster says, you never tell them the odds, <laughs> but, uh, it's basically, um, the little one liner here on IMDb <laughs> star Wars fanatics take a cross country trip to George Lucas's Skywalker ranch. So their dying friend can see a screening of star Wars episode one, the phantom menace before its release. Ah, uh, how little they know what a fool's errand this is. But anyway. <laughs> um, it could be a so, lot, a lot, a lot worse. Let's be real. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, uh, why don't we uh, we'll start with you, Dustin. Is this your first time seeing this movie? And what is your uh, first impression with it? This is my first time um, hearing about this movie at all, really. And I said earlier that um, one of the most unbelievable things to me is that people could care so much about Star Wars. Um, it's been, I don't know, the franchise has been like mercilessly destroyed in the last uh, 10 or so years. And I used to maybe be one of those people who would be this excited about Star Wars, but I don't know, it's like the memory has been erased. Like I just, I just don't get it anymore. Like it's it's pretty bad, and so it's kind of a weird relic of you know you could actually get this excited for something like what is this? So I mean I thought it was okay, like it didn't really impress me or make me feel much of anything. It's just kind of like huh, all right that was that was a thing. Like it's a passable movie. It's just um, not uh, I don't know. It's it's kind of hard to put my feelings into words because it's just sort of like it was a movie it's fine i mean i think i'd maybe give it like a i think i'd give it like a five out of five or something just just generic like okay movie and some of the jokes like really made me like roll my eyes okay a lot of the jokes really made me roll my eyes who are we getting but um all right i don't know i've seen much worse i did enjoy all the jabs at star trek because star trek was um well i feel the way about star trek like today that the people in this movie did so all right star trek sucks <laughs> all right is that is that uh bill for you at the moment yep that's me all right uh how about you tammy is this your first go around with this and what's your thought? Well, well, David said we watched it once before, but I don't I, I don't know, some of it looked familiar, so but I remembered it more this time, obviously. So <laughs> um I thought it was a lot of fun, you know. Um I know from our front troll how much people can get into Star Wars. You know, he's quite obviously made me you all know, been quite obvious about that and um and i know people that are totally into star trek also so i mean it didn't seem like that off the wall that these kids could be you know going to do this you know because they were such diehards you know but i you know, i thought it was a lot of fun it was quite abusing it was all the different stupid stuff that they got into was just, and they're all so different. You know, that's what I thought was really cool about it. Their personalities are all different. They're all, 
um, bring their own thing to the group. And I thought that's, that was neat. You know, here, these guys are all friends and they, they just, they're not, they all bring their own, own little thing. You know, I thought it was a lot of fun. I really liked it. I like Star Trek and I like Star Wars. So I'm not into, I'm not a diehard fan of either one of them, but I enjoy both. So I thought it was fun. All right. Um, all right. So if that's does it for you, I guess we'll move on to Brandon. Your thoughts on this one? Is this your first go around? No, I don't know why. I kept thinking that this was going that this week's selection was role models. And I don't know. Different. I don't know why. I, I just pair them together. They're, they're very different movies. Um, but I really enjoyed it the first time I saw it, which I had to get it when I heard about it. And uh, then uh, seeing it this time, it brought back some good memories. I really did enjoy it. Um, there's just a lot of general fun here uh, with this. I, myself, um, as a uh, not really a Star Wars Ultra fan, but uh, I did get caught up in a lot of the hype over Phantom Menace. And even the hype was so large. Most of y'all were around during that time period. Um, I think all of you, really. Uh, but uh, I was definitely the character's age at that time. I think I was in college when it came out. And I remember even in the small country town I was raised in, people had a line around the block at the theater, and they were all dressed up. And that never happened in my hometown. It just goes to show you how amazing the film, uh, well, okay, how amazing the hype uh, around the yeah, film yeah, there was. You go. Uh, I had a friend of mine who had said, I am going to watch this film as many times as humanly possible. He ended up watching the film, I want to say, uh, 20 times in theaters. Whew. Uh, I couldn't get that far behind it because I was greatly disappointed. And to this day, it is my least favorite Star Wars movie of all time. Uh, but I I will no, say... Oh, it, it's very possible. I feel, like, I feel like if you see it, I think that The Phantom Menace, if you were young, young when you saw it, it could hold the nostalgia. But I feel like as an adult seeing it for the first time, it really had nothing to save it <laughs> but yeah that's my uh that's my thoughts on it all right uh and how about you mr nerf herder uh is this your first time watching it and what what were your thoughts no it is not and uh i grew up watching star wars and star trek around uh, the same time um i was not really a diehard either way uh but i did feel like each had <sighs> strong fandom on either side um now i've never fully been to a, a con to see the you know uh, how cons can be but i do feel like if i i did go to a con that this is exactly the uh, uh, the kind of rivalry that you would see between the uh, the two factions there are <laughs> some very nerdy people out there con uh, <laughs> <laughs> with some very strong opinions uh, on either uh, side and uh yeah, I, I was entertained by this uh, movie. I mean, uh, uh, just recently, I just got uh, uh, through watching The Walking Dead, so, uh, so the, cur the curly-haired chubby guy, um, he was actually in 
the uh, Walking Dead for a little bit. So that was kind of cool to revisit watching an earlier role of him. Um, And uh, yeah, um, this was like, like similar to like watching like one of those Euro trip movies, the uh, the road trip movies. Oh, I love the Euro trip movies. Uh-huh. <laughs> Except with, with Star Wars in my uh, in mind, and it, it, it kind of had like an interesting plot. You know, I mean, uh, I remember this time period. I remember the Phantom Menace being a big thing in that area of the universe. Um, I do remember the hype. I do re- 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 remember when people went and saw it. And we're so let down by it, and uh, I don't know. I was I was kind of neutral to it because on one hand I enjoyed some of it, on the other hand, it was ripping off so much uh, so mu- uh, much other shit in the past. Uh, it was kind of pathetic, and yeah, um, I was not a fan of the uh, the the, the that, that trilogy. Uh, entirely uh, because I feel it went way too fast into the whole Anakin st- uh, storyline. I feel like if they did something like they did with Mandalorian, maybe they actually might have been able to resurrect it. Well, I think that what they what they have done after the fact by uh, in by doing I've been trying to rewatch Clone Wars. Actually, no, I've been trying to watch the. Uh, the other animated Clone Wars, the computer one, and I'll admit it makes me feel a little bit more interested in it. It doesn't. It does not. Uh, it still does not heal the wounds uh, made by the first and second of the trilogy, but definitely the third one, which I like the most anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I enjoyed this movie for what it is. I mean, <sighs> trying to th- uh, uh, think. I think. Uh, Another movie that kind of reminded me of this was Empire Records, just a little bit yeah. with, with the, uh, the the nerdy fandom with with the with the with the storyline of the chick at the comic store that uh, that was in love with the uh, the guy that was always in the comic store, you know. So yeah, uh, that's such a good that was such a good movie, Empire Records. That was it's one I keep thinking about putting forward. It's a good one. Need to do that and then have it paired with high fidelity. Yeah, that'd be a good one. Simply don't want to do two first if we can avoid them. <laughs> oh, I mean, like, yeah, you know, one week that and one week high fidelity. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, I think uh, that's pretty much it for me. All righty then. Uh, yeah, you got me thinking. Like, I was thinking Dan Fogler looked very familiar. He did have a recurring role on Hannibal, but uh, and Jay and Silent Bob reboot. But the big thing, he played Jacob Kowalski in the Fantastic Beasts movies, uh, and apparently he's also in Sharknado Five: Global Swarming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> High quality role there. Um, <laughs> Some reason that's on sale for like fifteen bucks for like the fifteen discs. for the six disc set right now. Oh, wow. nice. So just so you know, it's uh. It's been re-released. It's no longer just in that two hundred dollars steel book anymore. Right. Oh, it's that expensive now. <laughs> Holy crap! That steel book went up so much so fast. Like it was like two fifty in like twenty twenty. <laughs> Ooh, wow! Glad I got it when it came out. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I, I I'm kicking myself for not getting it when it came out because it was like I had it in my hand and I was like, eh, do I really care that much about this? And then I went home, and it was like surprise. It's like 180 right now. It's like oh, and I went back, and they were all gone. Uh, all right. So yeah. this yeah, actually, this actually I think feels I like the maximum way. overdrive at the time over Sharknado, and I myself am somewhat kicking myself for not. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, Max Overdrive with the slipcover from Bestron is kind of expensive too. So hmm. that was a good pickup. Like at the time, I think I don't think that's what I bought over Sharknado. I bought something else over Sharknado, but you you made a better call than me. 
See, this actually seems to me like a movie that's screaming out for a collector's edition. Like, I could almost see Arrow or maybe Shout doing this one. And um, for for reasons that I'll hopefully get into as we go along, I think it deserves a re-release. But um, Fanboys is one that I cannot swear to it, but I feel like, Brandon, you might have shown it to me first. I feel like maybe we watched it as a group thing one night, but I can't remember for sure. But whatever the case, it was a few years back. I have no recollection of whether I saw it again, but I definitely had a copy sitting on the shelf for the longest time. And that was one of the reasons this got picked was because I was like, oh, I have this on DVD. It'd be a good opportunity to move something along. Uh, (laughs) And also I picked it partly because we had our Star Wars month just a couple months ago and uh, seemed like good timing. Um, My initial thoughts on this were that it was a really... It was a very fun movie. It was very... You could tell, I think, that the people involved... That they, that, that this was... It may be kind of a dumb throwaway comedy that won't make nearly as much cultural impact as the Star Wars films themselves. But you can tell that the people involved were really into it. You know? <laughs> Uh, supposedly the director, Kyle Newman, is a major fanboy himself of Star Wars, and the film draws a little bit from his own experiences, uh, obviously vastly exaggerated in this film, (laughs) but a lot of it was drawn from experience, you know what I mean? So, like, a lot of things start somewhere. Um, And most of the cast, too, or at least, if not huge Star Wars fans, at least they get the fandom, if that makes sense. Um, Apparently, Seth Rogen is on record as being more into Star Trek than Star Wars, um, which, of course, he has a dual role as an uber Trekkie and as a, I guess you could say, uh, hardcore (laughs) Star Wars fan, uh, who also happens to be a Vegas pimp. Uh, (laughs) um, You got a ton of cameos in this. And the first time around, I caught a lot of them and enjoyed a lot of them. This time around, I think I caught a few more of them. And uh, that can be a lot of fun. Um, A lot of the humor is very much that late aughts kind of mid-level humor kind of um there are some com- there are some connections here with Kevin Smith uh he and Jason Mewes do have a cameo apparently he was lined up to play Harry Knowles and his frequent collaborator Ethan Suple ended up stepping in because he had too much work left to do on Clerks 2 uh So Kevin Smith's involvement should probably come as no surprise. Uh, But the film kind of feels like Kevin Smith light, to be honest. I I feel like it it does come off as someone kind of trying to make a Kevin Smith film without really uh, having... It's not quite there, you know? It's like... And and Brandon mentioned role models. I feel like that's kind of in the same vein comedy wise. So it's not a, a weird to think of them in the same thought, you know. Uh it's similar to what we visited a few weeks ago with Wet Hot American Summer, except that this one's not quite as extreme and it's intent to shock and offend as I think that one was. <laughs> um If anything, this one is a little milder, but one of the reasons why I was saying I think it might need another release is apparently this was released by the Weinstein Company, 
And apparently they demanded Harvey Weinstein, uh, may he rot uh, wherever he is, uh, he apparently decided to demand reshoots for the film to appeal to a broader audience. Uh, Stephen Brill was brought in, they did some reshoots, and the version that we have here is a hybrid of Kyle Newman's version and the Weinstein-mandated version. So I wonder if there ever will be a director's cut of this film and if that will be more, if Dustin, if you would find that more impressive uh, or or what have you. Uh, I wonder how much of the dumb comedy was mandated by the Weinsteins. I, I don't know. I guess I didn't get around to watching the deleted scenes and now I kind of wish I did. <laughs> but... Um, at any rate, I thought it was a fun movie, and it held up reasonably well, even though some of the humor doesn't land for me the way it did when I first saw this movie. Um, but the basic idea, the basic idea of a road trip movie, um, estranged friends reconnecting over a shared love, all that kind of stuff, not the most original plot line in the world, but it's well done. And again, it's done by people who clearly cared about what they were doing, uh, at least until it got to the uh, corporate level. Uh, <laughs> so um, I guess we'll go ahead and start. <coughs> uh, did you have something, Brian? Oh, no, I just coughed. <laughs> Oh, okay. So you jumped in just to cough. Good times. I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I will admit, yes, I, I probably should comment um, as well on my background with Star Wars and Star Trek. Uh, I talked uh, about my Star Wars background, with, the, so I'm not going to go into too much detail there, except to agree that, yes, I believe it was my freshman year that Phantom Menace came out, and <laughs> I do remember something of the hype, and I remember going, eh, I'll catch it on video. <laughs> but I was just blown away by the reports of the hype and how much people were kind of, I was like, there's so many great films out, and y'all are lining up, really? Um, okay, more power to you. <laughs> and then everyone, it so many people hated Phantom Menace that I, it took me a while to get around to it. I just, I think, I, you know, it took a while to get around to it. Uh, so I really appreciate the last line in this movie, I got to say. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and as far as Star Trek, I mean, you know, when I was a kid, we were, uh, well, uh, you know, young, young adult, middle school, uh, you know. Uh, they had the last generation on in the afternoons, and I would watch it. And I don't know; I probably saw a season's worth of the show. I don't wouldn't swear to that. To this day, I've probably only seen one episode of the original Star Trek, <laughs> but I've seen a bunch of the movies, and I actually quite like the current series um, of movies. Which they unfortunately, I think they put them on hiatus when Anton Yelchin died. But uh, yeah. It's, I wouldn't mind seeing more in that series, but it's pretty dry. What's that? The original Star Trek is pretty dry. Yeah, I tried to I tried to watch it all back when I was doing stuff like that a lot, and I I had to really struggle to make it through. <laughs> right. uh, it's very sixties in a lot of ways. <laughs> oh, I loved it. I loved the original Star Trek. Uh, mm -hmm. The only one that I couldn't get into that I've seen is Deep Space Nine. Huh. And they've got a new series out, apparently. I don't even remember what it's called, but I think they've got like a brand new one they just started. But They oversaturated mm -hmm. for a little bit, but yeah. I think they're backing off of that now. Yeah. I've, I've watched up to at least Deep Space Nine. Yeah, I never saw that one either. Um, I caught up, uh, bits and pieces of Voyager and uh, Enterprise mm -hmm. for uh, uh, for some reason at the time. I just couldn't get into it. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as some of the newer series, Star Trek Discovery and all that jazz, um, Picard isn't too bad. Yeah. I also have a, a fun memory of, I think the only one I saw in theaters, I think, 
was it it was nemesis right was the last tsg movie or tng movie um yeah i believe so i think so the one where they killed off data <laughs> and I remember going with a friend who was, had a a, an, a a crush on Data, and when he died, just the look of horror on her face. I, I shouldn't hold that as a fond memory, but somehow I do. <laughs> See, I remember the original Star Trek growing up. I used to, I was watching it. You know, yeah. I do believe. Um, most of what I was probably watching was probably rerun still, but by the time I was watching it, but I was still young, you know. And then David got me into the other ones, otherwise, I hadn't watched the other Star Trek, you know, branch offs, you might say. Mm -hmm. Diego, be quiet. I was gonna say it sounds like we got a feline opinion in there somehow. Um, <laughs> Anderson says he hates Star Trek. He loves Star uh, Wars. Okay, but, good to know. Ah. Good to know. Oh, I thought that might have been Diego. See, I was always in the middle. I never really felt strongly on either franchise. Like, and and so for one, so it's it's always been kind of amusing and strange to me to see the extremes that people will go. So it's one of the reasons why I can watch this movie and just kind of laugh at the people who go to extremes. But on the okay. other hand, I do get extreme fandom and I've gotten pretty close on certain things. And so I get where they're coming from. I'll put it that way. Even if I don't fully get the object of their obsession, I, I feel like I get at least where the mindset, if that makes sense. So uh, you know, there's actually a movement right now of people trying to get Disney to buy Paramount so that they can have Star Trek and Star Wars in the same universe. <laughs> uh, that would be a bad move because Disney already owns most of everything else. So. I was going to yeah. say, the mouse doesn't need me more. <laughs> yeah. I say down with the mouse. Yeah, the mouse Too much cheese. Exactly. <laughs> but. Anywho, <laughs> let's launch into it. Um, so the basic plot is actually pretty straightforward. You have this group of friends. Um, Brandon's got a nice little poster up here. Um, we've got uh, the, um, what's his face? Uh, Air, uh, Windows, <laughs> who's played by Jay Baruchel. They're on the left. Then we've got Zoe, played by uh, Kristen Bell. Then we've got uh, Eric, who's played by Sam Huntington. Uh, Hutch, who's played by Dan Fogler. And Linus, who's played by Christopher Marquette. And the basic plot is that this is a group of friends going back a good long ways. Uh, Zoe, Hutch, and uh, Windows work together in a comic shop. Linus, we're not really sure what he does for a living, or at least I didn't catch it. And Eric has uh, quote unquote grown up. Uh, the early celebrity cameo we get is Christopher McDaniel, who shows up in all these kind of movies. Uh, who McDonald, sorry, Christopher McDonald, who plays his father, who's a car salesman, and. He and his brother have been groomed to be car salesmen themselves. And we find out eventually that his brother is also a Star Wars fan, but he apparently has swallowed the Kool-Aid a little harder in terms of quote-unquote growing up. Um, but Eric is clearly the brighter and more responsible one who's his father drops the bomb on him a little ways into the movie that he's going to take over the lot. Like, right away <laughs> and um this is after he's already committed to a road trip because he and linus are estranged linus took it as a personal insult when eric decided to grow up and uh we come to find out that linus is very ill and 
they're counting down to the release of the Phantom Menace, which again, getting into that hype, the first Star Wars production <laughs> in what was it, sixteen years? I think it was. It's been a while. Fifteen, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think they said fifteen years, but I think it, it was actually Jedi was what eighty? No, Jedi was eighty three, wasn't it? So, yeah, it would be about 16. Yeah, 83, yeah. Um, so, they're looking forward to this release. They're counting down to it. They have a counter, a device with a counter programmed into it. <laughs> and um, But apparently, Linus will not live to see the release. So, they kind of... They've been joking about this for a while of doing this road trip to ever Star since Wars. they were six years old, basically. Yeah, it's sort of been a. It's sort of been they. Hey, when I'm going to grow up, this is what we're going to do, you know. And then they, you know, again, Eric kind of just ignored the past and moved on. And but everyone else is kind of like joking, half joking about doing this. But when when uh, I think it's Hutch and Windows come and tell Eric what's going on, like, look, I'm just dying, dude. You gotta, you know. He he basically is like, okay, let's do it. Let's stop talking. Let's do it. You know, go on this trip. So the four of them go on a road trip and. Uh, Eventually, circumstances bring Zoe into the fold. So, you know, that, that sets up the basic plot. But I feel like this is kind of a movie where it's more character-driven than anything. Uh, it's really a series of... Almost a series of vignettes with the road trip as the connecting thread, really. Um, and, and the story of the two estranged trends bonding and reconnecting, what have you. There's some other stuff going on too, but um, we'll go ahead, I guess, and start with uh, with Eric since he is sort of nominally the, I guess, nominally the central character, you know, um, although it's kind of hard to say if any one of them really is, uh, but we'll start with him as the odd one out. Let's say that. Uh, what are y'all's thoughts on, on him as a character and and, on, and how he goes about everything. <laughs> well, I think he's kind of stuck in a, a situation uh, uh, so, uh, some of us end up being in, especially if you have a, a father who owns a business, a business and, you know, he's a stickler about, you know, uh, growing up and taking the ball by the horns and uh, doing what uh, what you uh, what you need to do to get out of that you know uh, background of nerdiness and I, I guess uh, this particular father was uh, looking for a someone to replace him when when he was you know in retirement so right and that's all uh, uh, that's all any father who owns a business uh, wants they want an heir to run the business <laughs> you know right so unfortunately it did seem like he was kind of stuck in this boring dull drumish world where, where all he could think uh, think about was work like uh, like uh, like it seemed like his father ha had some old schoolness about him where, where he was like almost suffocating so right but eric did, uh, I, I think i think he really w uh, meant well uh to, uh, to his fr uh, friends even though you know, he had to do a lot of growing up, you know. So. Right. If you think about it, there's a lot of movies 
out there that have that premise of you're doing some childish stuff. You need to grow <laughs> out of it. And, you know, the characters grow out of their childishness at the end. And in a way, there is a part of that that's true with this one as well. But it also has kind of a message of also don't give up on your dreams as well. Yeah. So, I mean, I kind of like that's a little bit refreshing in a lot of ways. Uh, because, like I said, I'm used to a lot of movies preaching to me, well, if you're into these hobbies, it's bad. Get a job. Stop doing things you like. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> It's worth noting, I didn't mention before, uh, like I said, some of the others work in a comic shop. Eric is an artist. He was working really, really hard at becoming a comic artist. And he still doodles on the side, but he he hides it. Like it's a it's it's something he doesn't he doesn't feel comfortable putting a lot of time and effort yeah. into. Uh, because it's seen as childish and whatnot. But it's one of the reasons why Linus is so pissed off at him. It's because they were going to start a comic together. And, uh, well, that just didn't happen. <laughs> so um, I know when it comes to my father, uh, <laughs> uh, I know I have an obsession with collecting movies myself. But... One thing that uh, that has always been, uh, been told to uh, to me is, you've got to live within your means, you know. So uh, so, I can I can see some uh, so, uh, somewhat what Eric is going through, <laughs> just a little bit. But, um, you know, you got to make sure all your bills are taken care of first, and and no. Yeah. How to get ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But, yeah. All right. Sorry, I had a cat at the door. Um, so, uh, anyone else uh, want to throw anything on on Eric? Or... Mm. All right. Uh, I guess we'll move on then to Linus, uh, sort of his counterpoint in this story. Uh, and again, actually, apparently one of the things that Weinstein wanted cut out of the film was the whole cancer storyline. But it's like, okay, but that's a very big part of the plot there. <laughs> Shows you why, uh, why Weinstein is no longer with us. <laughs> well, one of the reasons. But <laughs> um. Yeah, at any rate, the uh, maybe that was an example of what we were just talking about. People kind of di dismissing certain things. Like he was known as a kingmaker, and he was supposedly really good at spotting talent. But I guess he did, must not have thought much of this assemblage here. I don't, I don't know. It's weird. But. Um, but anyway, so like I said, Linus is definitely uh, dealing with some anger issues uh, at the world, at his lot in life, but also at his supposed best friend. Uh, he's kind of, at the beginning, he's, he's, he's kind of downright nasty to Eric. Um, but they... Uh, <laughs> They did have, what was that argument they had? Was it the one about, was it Boba Fett that they were arguing about? <laughs> they were arguing about Star Wars. There are a few different ones. Yeah. But it was like, it was one of those things where it's like, it's, you know, the, the hardcore fans, you'll get these really insanely... Uh, like arguments where they feel, where it feels like there's some high stakes involved and really it's not, but their anger at each other added like an extra layer. So that was an interesting argument that they were having there. But um, uh, they do eventually, of course, kind of mellow a little bit, but um, it's a sister, you sick bastard. <laughs> oh, that's what it was. It was the Luke Leia thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah. I loved how he drove up at the end. <laughs> Just yelled <Yeah>. that. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, that was uh, <laughs> that was kind of a uh, amusing because that is sort of a uh, long running debate uh, in that group. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I always always personally thought that was like kind of a silly thing to get hung up on, just because yeah. it's so obvious that. You know, her being his sister wasn't written until the third one. No matter what he says, like, that was almost definitely never the plan. So people are like, oh, well, she must have known. It's like, no, they just tweaked that in the third one. Like, just calm calm down, dorks. <laughs> right. Um, now, of course, uh, speaking of Leia, there are a lot of callbacks to her throughout the film. Including a nice little cameo from Carrie Fisher later on. Um, but they definitely, uh, there, there were a lot of, uh, in fact, there were a lot of fun callbacks generally in the film. Uh, some yeah. in the form of cameos, were, but there some. There was actually more. Than what's just, that? There was more than just Leia uh, who showed up. Uh, I believe it yeah. was. Um, Han Solo's friend. Yeah, Lando. Lando showed up. Yeah. How do you remember Lando as just Han Solo's friend? <laughs> <laughs> like, well, apparently, know. speaking of Han Solo's friends, apparently Peter Mayhew showed up as himself, but I missed that. I, I must have... Uh, maybe have that was... The guy with long hair. What's that? He would have been the really tall guy with long hair. Like, no, yeah. certainly, like two feet taller than everyone else in the scene. That that's who he would have been. Right, right. And they may have just been a. Uh, he may have been at the con or, or something, but he could have even been one. I don't know if anyone else remembered spotting him. I don't. Yeah. You know. But uh, but yes, Billy D. Williams shows up as a character named Judge Reinhold, <laughs> uh, and they caution him like, don't don't make fun of his name. You know. <laughs> I will admit, if, at this point, if your name is Reinhold and you become a judge, you're you kind of open yourself up to. It. I'm surprised that they didn't really go for making fun of him too much. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, um, but it was yeah, it was kind of interesting. And there were some other references to. Uh, was it Jay Baruchel that claimed that he? When he was talking to the his online girlfriend, I think he described himself as a uh, a white Billy D. Williams, right, or something. Yes, like he that. did. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, no, not really, not really. Um, although supposedly with a with the big glasses and the poofy hair. Uh, supposedly, Baruchel was supposed to evoke 1970s George Lucas. Like he, I guess maybe there should have been a little more of a scruffy beard, maybe. But otherwise, he was supposed to look a lot like Lucas did at that time. So that's was again one of the many callbacks they made to different aspects of the production and what have you. Um. So anyway, uh, we'll talk about Windows next. Uh, Baruchel has done a lot of these kind of movies. Like he was really big in the mid aughts and late aughts, doing you know kind of the uh, dumb comedies. You know, I know he was in Knocked Up, and uh, I want to say Apprentice. Yeah, oh, Sorcerer's Apprentice. Yeah, yeah, it might have been. I don't remember that movie very well. Uh, also, he was a voice hiccup in How to Train Your Dragon. Oh, yeah, 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 he plays hiccup in that, uh, that so good, really good, uh, voice acting, uh, role there. Um, <clears throat> but he did, uh, I want to say, I want to say Dodgeball. Am I remembering that wrong? Or I think so. He's in Tropic Thunder, uh, you know, um, Million Dollar Baby doesn't fit into that category, but that, <laughs> and then Almost Famous. Actually, talking about movies about fandom, Almost Famous is a classic. That that was a solid, solid film there. Um, well, maybe it wasn't Dodgeball. Anyway, yeah, you're, you're but fun stuff. 
Uh, but Baruchel, uh he plays this very nerdy dude, uh, Windows, who uh, has, at the start of the film, supposedly has an online girlfriend uh, who, during the course of their road trip, they go to meet up with. Uh, what was their online handle again? I should be able to remember that. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. But wasn't he something like white chocolate or something? I think that might have been his his one. Yeah. <laughs> um oh, what was her name? I don't know. I miss I'm missing it. I'm missing it. But uh, at any rate, um of course when they finally do meet up with her. They were all thinking it was going to be some 40-year-old dude or something like that. Instead, it's a teenage girl uh, who happens to be, I think Harry Knowles said it was her niece, uh, his niece. So we have a cameo from Ethan Souple as web guru Harry Knowles, the guy behind Ain't It Cool News. Uh, so again, he me on Twitter, and I don't know why. <laughs> Well, who knows? Maybe he thinks it's cool. I don't know. <laughs> but um, that was... Uh, basically, he is quite infuriated at the uh, at their temerity until they prove their fandom to him, in which case he uh, hooks them up with a contact uh, in, in, uh, in Vegas, uh, I believe. Was it? Or was this before... Yeah, Vegas was where the con was, right? I think I'm remembering that right. But before they had gone, this was in Texas, but before that, they drove up into Iowa, basically so that our other main character, Hutch, could thumb his nose at the Trekkies. <laughs> so Hutch, Dan Fogler, is a very colorful individual <laughs> he's a little coarser than the others a little cruder uh a little more uh in your face confrontational and again he basically drives them several hours out of their way to go to the birthplace of kirk captain kirk so that Basically, they could thumb their nose at Trekkies, and they end up at a dedication for a statue of sorts uh, with a guy played by Seth Rogen who is leading a band of... He, he, he very emphatically says, not Trekkies, we are Trekkers. Uh, but yes, that turns into a bit of a mess <laughs> well yeah because because uh, ultimately he's uh, he uh, call, calls han solo a little bitch yes he called han solo a bitch and hutch was not taking that line down. <laughs> so um but what are y'all's general thoughts on hutch and windows anything you want to throw out about them or I get a kick out of Hutch. I like him. I mean, he actually yeah. reminds me of what uh um like like what like maybe Jack Black would have been like younger as a kid. You know? Yeah. <laughs> David I said, who did he remind you of? Oh Booger. <laughs> yeah. He reminded me and reminded me of Booger in Nerd. Yes. Yes. And I that <laughs> might have been intentional. I don't know. I know that um, I saw in the featurette that I watched. I watched a couple of the featurettes, and um, and uh, Kyle Newman claimed that uh, he. I think he saw a headshot of Fogler and thought, "Wow, this guy he'd be he'd be almost perfect for the for the this role." But then, so he went to meet him, and I think he said something like a half hour in, he knew that he had to have this guy in his movie. 
<laughs> because apparently Fogler really does get the Star Wars fandom. Like he really, apparently he was acting, but he was drawing a lot, you know, from inside as well, apparently. Um, so he, he definitely was one that was cast pretty quickly, apparently for, for his particular role. Um, they also repeatedly said in the um, behind the scenes stuff I saw that the two of them kind of, well, the five, the, the quintet is supposed to be a very direct, direct echo of the main characters in Star Wars, the original Star Wars. Uh Basically, Eric is supposed to be Luke. Like, he's the stand-in for Luke. You know, the milk toast kind of not too... Uh, kind of the, the stand-in for the audience kind of character, really. Um, who ultimately becomes a major important part of the story. Uh, that's kind of... Um, and Linus is sort of Obi-Wan. He is supposed to be sort of the wise old soul who kind of keeps everyone on track and focused and going forward after a fashion. And, of course, the fact that he's doomed to die at the end kind of also echoes Obi-Wan, I suppose. Um Hutch and Windows are supposed to be the R2 3PO comic relief duo. <laughs> yeah. um, I can see that because Hutch, yeah. Hutch is funny. He is, he's, just, he's off the wall, you know. Right. He could also be the Chewbacca factor. Well, yeah. yes. And that's what I was going to say as well. Like they're supposed to be that duo, but Hutch is also a stand in sort of for basically the whole Millennium Falcon cast. Like, maybe not so much Lando, but definitely Han Solo and Chewie. Um, he is supposed to be a stand-in for them. His truck is supposed to be a... Well, Van is a stand-in for the Millennium Falcon, you know. So that's kind of, you know, where that is. Uh, but yeah, the fact that he's kind of short and stout and Windows is tall and skinny really adds even more to that. <laughs> and of course Zoe is Leia. I mean that's obvious um <laughs> in many ways. Um there's some differences of course in all of those connections. It's not a perfect analogy uh of course cuz Zoe would probably end up with Hutch if it was trying to be a perfect analogy, but you know, it's that the way that they they apparently the cast and crew that was their working idea of who these people kind of represented. Um, and like I said, you can definitely see some of that. I think you can see some of that in each of them. Uh, they are their own, but they're also, you know. But, it's like I said at the beginning, they're all yeah. different in their own way. Yeah. But then they all come together. You know, they all bring Indeed. something. All right. Yep. And of course, what brings Zoe into the fold uh, is, I believe it. Oh, well, let me see here. Was that? Was it? Um, it was Iowa, right? I'm trying to remember. I think it was Iowa. Might have been. Oh, maybe it's, I think it was that where they they got in trouble. No, it was the Southwest. It was on the way to Vegas. That's what it was. Because they, because the fuzz came up behind them and they thought it would be a great idea to outrun the cops. Well, Hutch did. Hutch, well, I think that he was getting egged on by the others. And when he, uh, I think it was Linus that actually said, um, you want me, do you want to use the uh, light speed? And and then Hutch is like, yeah, yeah, light speed. And Eric's like, what do you mean light speed? <laughs> but when they had gotten in the van, Hutch had said there were three rules. And I think it was the second rule. Oh, and that's what Linus says. He's like, do you want to break the second rule? 
because the second rule was don't touch the big red button. <laughs> <laughs> what were the other yeah. rules? I don't remember. Oh, well, number one was rush. Yes. Only rush gets played. Only rush gets played, yes. And that actually, that played into another bit of fandom, which I appreciated as well, in part because one of my brothers went through a huge rush phase where he was obsessed with rush. But a lot of rush fans are fanatics in a way that a lot of bands just don't see that level of fanaticism. <laughs> um and it's also a uh, band that was heavily referenced in the book Ready Player One. I mean, it's 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 a band where this kind of fandom, it makes sense to use them as the soundtrack. Let's put it that way. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that was that was R- Hutch's rule number one. And uh, what was the rule number three? Uh, I'm trying to remember. Um. Mm. It was, I thought I thought it had something something to do with eating or drinking or it was something to do with something like you know. <laughs> that I can't might, remember what it was now. I think of it at some point, but basically, uh, the uh, mm. there, yeah, like I said, the flashing lights come on behind them, and I, um, I'm not sure if this happens then, but. Uh, but I remember the R two D two screaming while they were racing at one point. Yes, that comes in the plate just about now. Yeah, yeah, that was one thing where we had. Um, he has an R two uh, replica attached to the top of his fan, and the <laughs> horn sounded like Chewbacca. Uh, 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 so uh, when Eric came to the rescue with the van at the Star Tre- uh, uh, Trek fight. Or uh, 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 you heard Chewbacca go, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, apparently they game. have a, a rule where you they yell Chewbacca instead of uh, instead of shotgun. Um, okay, yeah, last time to hear you but... on the to, to make the to do that, you know, to make the tr- the van go faster and it wasn't working, and he yeah. did something else, and then that's when you heard the R two go. Eh! Yo, make yeah. his scream because then the van took off. <laughs> yeah, it did. And it, it and I uh, go straight down the highway for a while, and then they get to one of those <clears throat> T intersections, <clears throat> and of course they go straight through the billboard. <clears throat> and then we have an interesting visual where the the hole in the shape of the billboard looks kind of like Darth Vader's helmet, <clears throat> and you got the tail lights of the truck where the eyes would be. <laughs> that, that was cool. cool. <laughs> um, I did find it. He's like, rule number one in my van, it's rush. All rush, all the time. No exceptions. Rule number two, nobody touch the red button. And I mean, never touch the red button. Most importantly, rule number three, there's no jerking it in my van. Uh-huh. The windows is like, fine. He's <laughs> like, don't roll your eyes at me, Admiral Jack Bar. No, anyway. Um, so that was that. Um, so they get thrown in jail by Jolo Trulio, who we might remember from Wet Hot American Summer. Uh, and again, all of these kind of films that came out at this time period. Uh, and they get bailed out by Zoe. Um, and she comes along basically saying, like, y'all drag me all the way out here. I'm going with you the rest of the way. So she kind of becomes the 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 new member of the party as they roll on into Vegas. And, That's because um, nobody could nobody could take her. She said, "If anybody can take me, I'll go right." Back. And she does a chokehold on Hutch. <laughs> takes him out. <laughs> yep, that was right. that. Yep, it's even funnier because Kristen Bell is not a big person. <laughs> she is. <laughs> No, she is not. But not I, big at all. She went on to play Veronica Mars. Oh no, she did that long before this. But she came. Okay. I think the movie was after this. Okay. Of course, she also, also, what's that? She was also in the Reefer Madness musical, which um, a lot right. of people need to see. And she had a recurring role on Heroes uh, that lasted for, I think, the better part of a season. Um, unfortunately, I think it was the season everyone wanted to forget, but um, I could be remembering that wrong. 
Um, and she's done a bunch of other stuff over the years too. Um, you know, she's the voice of Anna in the Frozen movies, you know, for example. <laughs> uh, you know, just uh, I never heard of those, you know. <laughs> um, and then so basically, like I said, they roll up into Vegas. Uh, they are on a little bit of a time crunch but because they're supposed to meet a contact at this convention but windows wants to hit the tables and um he kind of sucks at it <laughs> and while they're on the casino floor he and hutch uh see two girls making eyes at them and uh you know, meanwhile, Eric and Linus are off trying to actually make uh, their their appointment with this contact. Um, and so we have two uh, kind of simultaneous uh, things going on. One being where uh, Hutch is getting it on with his girl. And Windows is, of course, just talking with his. And she makes him realize that, you know what? Um, you might be missing something uh, with this girl, Zoe. You know, you might be missing out on some clear signs here. <laughs> and, of course, he also misses out on the clear signs that these girls, you know, hooked up with them in the first place until eventually he comes to realize that, oh, wait a minute, they are uh, escorts. And uh, he goes to try to warn Hutch. The two girls are not too pleased about this. And they get in touch with their contact. Uh, I guess you could say Pimp, their handler. Who, again, is Seth Rogen. And uh, comes all in, all, you know, ready to throw down. Until he realizes that, hey, we got some fellow Star Wars fans here. He shows them his tattoos to show the light side and the dark side. And he's all proud of them and everything. And he's like, uh, Hutch is like thinking, great, we got a break here. And he's like, no, no, y'all definitely still owe us. You owe us a lot. You know, it's, it's like thousands of dollars or whatever. Um, and, to, and to add insult to injury, he, he raided their mini bar and he's eating those peanuts that are, what they say, like $10 of a nut. <laughs> Eight dollars a thing. So, yeah, it's uh, pretty friggin' expensive. Meanwhile, um, Eric and Linus meet the contact, who it turns out is William Shatner, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I could almost see Shatner actually pulling shit like this in real life, just for shits and giggles. I mean, <laughs> he has reached a point. Even when this movie came out, I think he had reached a point in his career where he could almost do whatever the hell he wanted. And he really, now I think he's reached a point in his career where he can do whatever the hell he wants and doesn't have any fucks left to give. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but that's the impression I've gotten. <laughs> but definitely... I actually thought it was pretty hilarious when he showed up with the plans to Lucas's ranch. <laughs> and uh and I quite enjoyed that little scene. But of course then the fan the the Trek fans led again by Rogan and his other role uh show up and uh they're not too pleased about the people who wrecked their statue back in Iowa. And so they start, Eric and Lana start running, and the other two start running, and eventually they, they run into each other with Rogan closing in on both sides, <laughs> playing different characters. Um, and I think, I don't remember where Zoe was in that whole thing, but I think at this point she kind of comes to the rescue, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, actually, doesn't she come in and kind of wail on uh, on Rogan's character? I feel like she does. I can't. I don't know if y'all remember more clearly. I I admit I don't remember every bit and piece. But anyway, um, 
So do y'all have anything to, to, to comment on up to this point? Anything that I have missed, glossed over, or that you had anything you just wanted to throw out? So, in hearing the events of the plot again, it does kind of sound like um, it does kind of sound like it's a version of like the Hangover or something. There's just so much kind of random stuff happening like in the way, and those were those were kind of what comedies were like of the time, right? Oh yeah. So and I wonder if it almost uh, suffered now or at the time, maybe from like people were tired of that or. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of curious because I had never heard of this movie at all, and that kind of film was so popular at the yeah. time. I feel like it would have gotten some attention, and no matter what. Well, I think I part of it. it I, I think part of it was because of the issues with the Weinstein Company. This film probably didn't get the backing that it would have otherwise, and it actually was filmed in 2007. The reshoots took place in fall and winter, I think, of that year. But it wasn't actually released until 2009. And actually, 2009 is when The Hangover came out. Uh, I think this came out This came out in February. And The Hangover came out in May. May, June, May, June. So technically this did it first, but I think you're right. I do think that there there was a sort of well that both of these films were drawing from that was really, there were a lot of movies at this time period. That, and it may have been one of the reasons why the Weinsteins were cool to this movie was that they probably didn't think it would be able to be a top seller. Um, I guess we'll never know for sure. Uh, and actually, the poster art was very specifically meant to evoke uh, the 40-year-old virgin, which came out, I think, in, what was that, 06, maybe? I think that was... I think that was 06. Um, 05. Okay. So 2005, um, Judd Apatow had burst on the scene with that. He followed up with Knocked Up, which came out in 07, uh, which, again, a Jay Baruchel movie there. Uh, so, yeah, there was a lot of this kind of stuff going on around then. This movie actually is a lot tamer, I think, in a lot of its humor than most of the Apatow movies were. And then The Hangover. Uh, those were going... Hangover went hard R, pretty much. This one was PG-13. But again, I wonder if that original cut, where that would have fallen, you know? Um, hard to say at this point, but... Um, Anyway, uh, but yeah, the Vegas connection definitely does bring the hangover to mind. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, so I guess this kind of leads to... I think it was right after this that they were kind of on the cusp of maybe giving up. And then they decided to soldier on ahead, basically. Um, and if I recall correctly, I think it was Eric who said, basically, we've come this far. We need to finish. We need to, you know, finish what we set out to, to do. Um, so they get out there. They get out to Skywalker Ranch. And uh, the floor plans Shatner provided are, um... oh, okay, that's what it was. They, uh Linus got very, very ill, and they had to go to the hospital. That was the 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 the, the soul searching moment. Um, I love that Terry Fisher was the doctor. <laughs> What's that? I love that Carrie Fisher was the doctor yes. at the hospital. Yes, yes, and, Carrie Fisher and that he got to do the kissing scene with her. <laughs> yes, I love you. I know. <laughs> she got to say, "I know." <laughs> 
Right. So like I said, fun little callback there. Um, she kind of comes on as like just this basic hard ass doctor who's telling him straight up, you, you need to go home. You need to go to the hospital. Uh, apparently there's a deleted scene of him throwing away the meds she gives him because he's basically decided to go all in for what they're doing. But that was one of the things that was a bridge too far, apparently, for the Weinsteins. They, they, so that was left on the cutting room floor. Um, but he uh, he kind of gives them an out. He's like, I yeah, I don't know, you know. But like I said, I think it's Eric who steps up and is like, no, we we got to finish. You you want this? We we're going to do this for you. Um, and so like I said, they go. Uh, Windows is ecstatic when Hutch it lets him know that, yes, you can use the grappling hook that you brought. <laughs> I'm not sure that they needed it, but, you know, they got to use it. Um, they get into the compound easily enough, but then they run into security. And here's where we get to see a whole bunch of fun cameos. Uh, they're wearing these weird-ass masks. I'm not sure exactly what they're supposed to be, but they're wearing these weird-ass masks that they eventually all take off pretty quickly. Um, and the one of the security guards is Ray Park, uh, who we will recognize from The Phantom Menace, of course, uh, and or from X-Men for anyone... Uh, that was basically his brief moment of glory. <laughs> Those two films. Uh, so he comes in and, along with a couple other dudes. And then we have another group of security guards who are played by uh, Will Forte and Craig Robinson. Again, familiar faces for these kind of shows. And then we meet another familiar face, the head of security, who is played by Danny McBride. And he sits them down, is ready to read them the riot act, as it were, until he gets a call from Mr. Lucas. And basically informs, what is it he says? Like, I have just been informed that my opinion has changed. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, uh, apparently, Mr. Lucas is uh, touched that you would go to this trouble. Uh, and he uh, basically, instead of uh, reading them the riot act, he basically sets them down for yet another Star Wars quiz session, um, which they pretty well um, they pretty well pass. Um, okay, what was that? Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. Mr. Lucas is touched and mildly flattered by what you have done here. And I have been informed that I feel the same way. <laughs> so the charges are going to be dropped. That is, of course, if you are what you appear to be. Oh, what do we appear to be? Fanboys. Something we can easily determine with a simple quiz. <laughs> yeah, so that, like I said, that is a pretty fun little uh, section there. Um... It's always fun for me, at least. I always like seeing McBride. He's a he's a fun character, for character actor. He uh, actually he shared a uh, screen credit with uh, Baruchel on Tropic Thunder. The the guy, uh, the demolitions guy, uh, who somehow lost a finger on the set of Driving Miss Daisy. How <laughs> 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 he did that? Uh, so he's. Gives them, like I said, to get this quiz. And at the end, he's like, okay, we're going to let you go. First, you get to watch the film. And at first, they're all ecstatic. He's like, no, not you guys, you. And he points at Linus. He's like, you get to watch the movie. So they give him a chance to actually sit in Lucas's screening room, watch a rough cut of the film, Uh he comes out, lets them know that, you know, it's all good. I I can, basically, I can die happy now, you know. 
Uh, and then it cuts ahead a little bit to them all waiting in line to see the actual release of the film. And then right before the credits start rolling, the, for the initial crawl starts rolling, you got Eric going, hey, guys, what? What, man? What if the movie sucks? <laughs> That's your final line in the movie. It goes into the credits. And it's like, and I like that as a final line. I think that's a pretty good. Uh... <laughs> I really like that whole final setup mm -hmm. where he goes to sleep when they're all camping together and then he wakes up in the tent and then they're camped outside the theater. Right. Not only did that bring back memories of waiting in line for the, uh, for the movie. And we did that stuff. I mean, on sure. the eve of its premiere uh, in Covington, not the best theater run, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. we sat there and we we got there super early and there were already people lined up who camped out. Mm. We, several of my friends had already dressed up. It was really fun. It was just like uh, mm. everybody was really hyped and we got to share in the hype. It was just a real fun thing sent, setting up half the night mm -hmm. uh, and half the day waiting for the premiere. It was just really great. Yeah, I've, I've never done that. I've I've been I've showed up early for a film, but I not that it, early. <laughs> it's not. It, it wasn't something that I would have done on my own. Yeah. But when I had a bunch of friends and we just wanted to hang out and have fun, that wasn't about the yeah. movie. I could have I could have waited until the movie's hype died down and yeah. seen it. It was about the fact that I had a whole bunch of people around me who were super hyped. And sometimes when you get a whole bunch who are around you and you got all that positive energy going around. Mm -hmm. You just want to be a part of it, you know? Yeah. It's like, it's like the Harry Potter movies. I mean, there's a reason why I saw the fifth Harry Potter movie like eight times in theaters. <laughs> yeah. Not because I like the movie. I really don't like the movie at all. But <laughs> and well, three times in IMAX. Uh, I, I remember that was the one I got to see in IMAX. So that was, uh, you know, and unfortunately the local theater that does IMAX properly uh, apparently has moved away from popular films and left it to the multiplexes, but I, IMAX in a multiplex is highway freaking robbery. It is a sham, and it is stupid, and I am glad I got to see at least one film the way IMAX is supposed to be seen. But, yeah. I mean, I saw Revenge of the Sith four times in theaters, but not by choice. It was because I just kept tagging along with people that went. You know, I never saw the first two in the series in theaters, but I saw that one four times. And so I know what you mean. Like, if I had been with people who were really that stoked, I mean, I was with some hardcore movie nerds at the time, but they weren't that stoked about Star Wars. Like, they were, you know, there were other movies they were more interested in. Um, but yeah, it's... I, I admit, I agree with you. It was kind of cool seeing, you know, that they had done the the cosplay and all that kind of fun stuff. And again, seeing his brother show up and like, oh yeah, well, this guy's not a total sh uh, tool after all. He does still get out and have fun occasionally. Um, <laughs> you know, so that was, that was kind of nice. Um, but yeah, uh, what, what are the rest of y'all's thoughts on that final... Se a couple of se sections. I did remember, um, I never really saw much about it, but I heard about it. Like the people that uh, did do the um, the camping out and stuff, like I saw pictures in the paper, but it wasn't really something you could watch really live. So it was only like in the really big cities that that would happen. Um, I think the closest thing I ever did to something like that was um, for Halloween 2018, I wore my Myers, Michael Myers costume. But uh, that's, uh, that's as close as I got, personally. As far as camp, I didn't exactly camp out. Uh, I tried out for American Idol, like, some years back and had to be there, like, really early. And there was, like, a ton mm -hmm. of people in lot, uh, line, like, at, like, 4 o'clock in the morning oh, yeah. down in the town. Oh, yeah. <laughs> for casting calls, yeah, sometimes you got to be early. And, um, yeah. I know when uh, they didn't do a casting call 
uh, for major pain the day that I worked there, but it was like you had to be there at the butt crack of dawn. And I think it was like the, the a certain number of people were, were allowed to come in or something like that, you know? Um, that's kind of how it was. So you had to be early, early. Um, and that's why we only did one day because we were kids and we didn't understand that concept. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's... The only thing I stood in line for is um, Blockbuster. Um, well, twice. I did for Titanic when Titanic came out on VHS. Hmm. And when the first um uh Neon <laughs> the vamp vampire um series. Um Oh, Twilight? Yeah, when the first Twilight came out. They had a special edition, like wedding I'm sorry. And anniversary edition. Uh, we were uh, we were collecting the, uh, them at the t uh, time, and it seemed like a really nice addition. So we waited right. like at night in line for it. Got a copy. Not I've that I care about the series. Like I said, I've done a few things that involve waiting in line. Like I did go to one of the midnight screenings for Harry Potter. I think it might have been Half Blood Prince. Uh, that yeah, it was. Um, but I, it wasn't like a wraparound line. It was like I was probably in line for an hour or so. Um, and then, like, as far as you're talking about um, releases on home media, they used to do midnight release parties at Movie Stop. Uh, may they rest in peace. Uh, Movie Stop was a fun thing that we had. And I know, Brandon, I know you went to a couple of them too. But uh, I did a few midnight release parties and – They'd give out prizes and stuff, and so I'd show up a half hour early, 40 minutes early, you know, for those. And um, I do have a really cool cutout I got from the Alice in Wonderland release. Um, so, I still got the teacup. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, I love the yeah. Avengers one. The, the Avengers yeah. Midnight Party was great. I got a shirt, but it's way too small for me. I need to lose a lot of weight. <laughs> but, yeah, there were some good ones. Um some good ones out that, but like I said, I miss that. I miss them. But um, anyway, getting a little off topic. Uh, <laughs> um, and actually, one scene we kind of skipped a little bit was we mentioned Iowa. Um, somewhere right around there, they pulled into a a bar, and. Um, it ended up going not the way they expected, um, but the van had broken down. And um, there they ended up meeting uh, Danny Trejo. And uh, he played a character who who kept talking about the chief. And it wasn't until the end that he finally said that, you know, that, that I, the chief just likes to talk about himself in the third person or something to that effect. But basically, he gave them some uh, beverage laced with peyote, and they uh, they went on some interesting trips. And that was one of the reasons why they wanted to outrun the cops. Okay, so yeah, this was in Texas. That's why I'm saying that's why it was because they had the peyote. They had just gotten the peyote, I think, not long ago, and. Um, it and Linus was like, Yeah, you, you don't want to get caught by the cops. I've got a how much did he say it was? It was a lot, <laughs> he had a good amount. Uh, so let's just say he didn't want to get caught by the fuzz, but anyway, he had a whole bag of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I liked bag. that van. That van was fun. That van was fun, yes, very uh, they did they put a lot of work into making that van look pretty cool. Um, and it was clear that it was Hutch's baby. I mean, again, that was one of the, the whole, sort of the, the Han, Chewie, Millennium Falcon sort of connection there, because he really, that van was his baby, even though everyone else looked at it and called it a piece of crap or, or worse, which is kind of the way most people looked at the Falcon in the, in the movies. They were like a broken down piece of crap, basically. And, <laughs> 
So that was kind of, like I said, fun little nod there. Um, anyway, uh, we've gone through the plot. We've basically covered the characters. Um, Y'all have anything else you want to go into before we go into production? Not that I know of. Okay. Okay. So, uh, production-wise, this one, like I said, it did have the misfortune of having some forced reshoots, and the edit may or may not have been close to what it should have been. Personally, I feel it still plays pretty decently as a movie. Um, It's not obvious that there were some major, major issues behind the scenes, at least not to me. Uh, And wow, I did not notice this before. This may have something to do with Rush being featured in the score so heavily. Ernest Klein, the author of Ready Player One and Ready Player Two, is one of the credited screenwriters. So, yeah, there you go. He is definitely a Rush fan. (laughs) And Adam F. Goldberg, the guy behind the show, The Goldbergs, is also the other screenwriter on this. So, again, this definitely came from a place of love. (laughs) people who uh, knew their stuff. Um, What would y'all say in terms of the overall effects, costuming? We just talked a little bit about the van. Um, Would y'all say generally you feel like this one did a really good job of creating the world that we're, we're looking at? I love the costumes. And the van... The van to me was my favorite part of the production value because not only did it have all the lights, it had all the sound effects on it too, which were great. <laughs> right. I mean, I admit, I would not have, I, I was a bit of a nerdy kid in school, so I guess it wouldn't matter, but I would not have minded riding in the van uh, if I had friends who had that. <laughs> right. I got to admit, there is a part of me that's disappointed that it wasn't a Winnebago. <laughs> Actually, I'm not even sure that there were any specific Spaceballs references in here, but it would have been nice. <laughs> uh, I also will say production value also included all of the cameos, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. Because they were a part of the scenery, every single one to the Kevin Smith, uh, Jason yeah. Mewes one, where they kind of switched places there, <laughs> where yeah. uh, Smith was the mouthy. <laughs> that uh, was, um, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, was it Hutch or Window? It might have been Windows who needed to use the bathroom. I can't oh, remember. That was great. <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, and then Smith just sidles up to him. He's like, Don't you hate it when a restroom stall is locked? And, you know, a minute later, the door opens up. This big, beefy dude walks out, and Jason Mewes is with him. And he's just complaining, complaining, complaining. Oh, Jason Mewes like, runs like, the hell out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so there was that. Um, I've already mentioned that, that Seth Rogen had a dual role uh, as a couple of different characters. Uh, we mentioned Danny Trejo is the chief. Um Ethan Suple, oh, Rogue Leader was the, the, the call name of the girl that uh, that Windows was after. Um, so, again, Ethan Suple is Harry Knowles. Jolo Trulio is the guard. Billy D. Williams is Judge Reinhold. Jamie King is, um, is the wife of the director, Cal Newman. Uh, she and Pell James played the uh, escorts. Um, they got William Shatner is William Shatner. Um, you know, we mentioned just now Jim, Jason Mees, Kevin Smith, Carrie Fisher is the doctor, and again, Ray Park, Chuck Gordon, Pina Reiner, Will Forte, Craig Robinson are the guards with Danny McBride as their leader. I, I love in the interrogation where they're on with Lucas, was it Shatner? 
like he knew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it is disappointing to me <clears throat> somewhat that they didn't actually get Lucas to show up. I think that would have been <laughs> really fun. Uh, his beard. <laughs> I kept What's expecting that? him to show up, actually. Right. That would have been would've, great. It would have been really... amazing. What's that? I say I agree. It would have been great. I but I was I kept expecting yeah. him. Like, come on, all these other people. Come on, dude, you gotta show up. You know. Actually, I could understand right. Harrison Ford not showing up just because he's kind of had a love hate relationship with yeah. Star Wars and Star Wars fans. But right. Mark Hamill. Yeah. It is a travesty that he did not show up because yeah. I could have seen him in that. <laughs> and and the and, and what's that more was surprising to me too. What's that? That was surprising to me too, because usually he likes yeah. stuff like this. Like he's like the only one who's a good sport about it. And what's more, he's worked with Kevin Smith before. Um, you know, and they're uh he probably was busy. And that's yeah. my guess is he was, he was probably, probably busy at the time and couldn't. Maybe he heard he Kevin Smith busy. wasn't going to be in the film. He was like, well, fuck this shit. Well, and like I said, um, Smith uh, apparently was going to play Knowles and his commitments to Clark's too. He could only commit to, I guess, a day instead of. Well, I don't know. It was not like Knowles was a much bigger role, but it was, it was, a still, a big, it was still a bigger role. It was still, yeah. Um, yeah, it would have been kind of, it would have been fun. There's a lot of shoulda, woulda, coulda as, as far as, uh, and apparently Nikki Cat was one of the people who was left on the cutting room floor. So there was at least one celebrity cameo that didn't make it into this cut. Um, but it would have been interesting. Some of the ones who could have been in there, but some of the ones who did, it is still really fun seeing, Carrie Fisher and Billy D. Williams and you know a couple of the others show up. That was that was a, a nice nice treat. This would have been a good contender for our best bit player cameo category. <laughs> but anyway, and use of music and film because yes, I do think Rush was reasonably well used in the soundtrack. Um, they did put they did give Tom Sawyer a prominent place. <coughs> have to in this sort of film uh <laughs> but at any rate uh what do y'all think well i guess mu music overall what would y'all say on on that uh, i think the music was pretty cool it, i think it fit for everything you know i myself like rush too you know i'm not just in the led zeppelin i do like rush Rush uh, and you know Rush does deserve a lot of the um, praise that they get. So, but do you like Rush enough to have that as your only uh, music choice in the cars? <laughs> okay, no, I'll ask my, a question and then kick myself out. Be, <laughs> if I could only have one music choice in my vehicle, it would be Led Zeppelin. So, <laughs> okay, <laughs> there can only be one. I, never I, got do, into Rush. I, do, I have a lot of respect for Rush, though. So. Yeah, yeah, same here. Um, well, Rush wasn't the only thing on the soundtrack. I commented on the message thread because it starts with this party that they're at in 1998, and they're and they're blasting tub thumping on the radio, and I'm and I just said I was like, nothing screams 1998 like Chumbawamba. There's <laughs> just nothing more than that but uh they actually only had a hand oh limelight was on there they only had a handful of rush songs on the final soundtrack but i guess the scenes in the van and you know um that's all you need yeah but limelight and tom sawyer are two of their key songs so i can see why they went with those um but yeah it's uh it's kind of fun um, but I can see again. Uh, I think I heard someone diss rush a couple minutes ago, though. I wasn't, uh, I think I was kind of in the I'm middle. I'm trying to say I never got into rush. 
I never got into them the way my brother did. Let me put it that way. I can, I appreciate them. I like them more than Zeppelin, to be honest. But I can fully appreciate why they are icons to nerds. Because they, at least one, I want to say all three of them are actually college professors. Uh, The late Neil Peart is actually a science fiction author. Uh, (laughs) They definitely have their uh, street cred, as it were, um, with with this kind of stuff. Um, And they do use uh, their their songs lyrically are very complex generally. So I can definitely see why, again, why that fandom and the Star Wars fandom, why they kind of bleed together. Um, and again, Rush was a huge part of the plot of Ready Player One, the book, not the movie. Apparently Spielberg didn't feel the same love for Rush that uh, Ernest Klein did. But uh, <laughs> um, it was a, it was a very interesting. Uh, so I'm not surprised he included a, a strong reference to it here. Um, well, I know I know that I'm older than all of you guys. So mm-hmm. when I got into Led Zeppelin, it was it was kind of like, no, no, no. You you got into Zeppelin. You got into Sabbath. You got into Rush. It was there was mm-hmm. like like five bands that were like like a must, you know. Yeah. And with the people I was hanging out with, and Rush was one of them, you know. And yeah. So that's why I said I have a lot of respect for them, and you know, because of how I got into them. So I think, yeah, I think it was ACDC, and I think um, to throw to throw the mix a little weird, it was Leonard Skinner. Ah, was. Was like the five that you you had you had to listen to you had to get into you know <laughs> <laughs> right now I'll, I'll admit um, this same brother also went through a Skinner phase and my other brother went through a Zeppelin phase where he tried to memorize every note of Stairway to Heaven and he was actually pretty good at playing it on the piano. Um, David still teases me to this day in a lot. What's that? The radio. David and a lot of my friends tease me to this day. They're, all I got to hear is like one note. And I'm like, Zeppelin. Yeah. I, know, yeah. I know it's a Zeppelin song. I just got to hear like the first note or two of the song that's coming on it. I immediately know. I mean, when I used to. Actually. And they do have the, a little bit of they do have a bit of a nerd connection too. I mean, Ramble On definitely was uh, steeped in uh, Lord of the Rings, and uh, I like that song. That's good. Um, and actually, I recently uh, an acquaintance of mine recently went to a show that I envy her because she got to see uh, Robert Plant is touring with Alison Krauss. You know, they've done a couple albums together. And he, yes. she got to see that, and I'm like, oh, I would love to see that show. I've seen Alison Krauss, but not Robert Plant. I think that would be a. I've seen really Robert cool Plant show. twice. He yeah. Came, it came. Um, I was still in. First time, or was I out? There was pay. There was two Page Plant tour. Yeah. Well, well the first one was mm-hmm. mainly Zeppelin, and it had some Plant in it, and some mm-hmm. Page of the. Second one was half Zeppelin, and the other half was um, Walking in Clarksdale, which was Jimmy Page's huh. release. Oh, okay. At the time, cool. But when, when I worked at Potawatomi, you know, they, they'd have music playing. You know, I worked mm-hmm. at the casino, and it wasn't very loud. And it, it depended on which area you worked in, you know. Mm-hmm. And there was the one area, that I, and I'd be like. Oh, they're playing Zeppelin. And everybody look at me like, how do you know? <laughs> it's like. <laughs> I don't know. Is playing. <laughs> I can do that with some bands. And, and I'll be going to see one of them in a couple weeks. But, you know, it's uh, not many of them, I'll admit. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, we'll go ahead. If, if, if Does anyone else have any other thoughts on uh, the production? Or we'll uh, move on into. 
I, mean, I just it's... real quick one. I like the I really I, I like the production. This, see, I like movies that they're not all CGI'd and all kinds of stuff. I like movies that are they're more mm -hmm. real. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's what I got out of this. It was, you know. I like I like the how they you know, the different things they did and everything that you, you know that they didn't have to use all kinds of computers and CGI and all this, you know. Right. So I I did like the production a lot. I liked I thought what they wore was cool, a fit, you know, mm -hmm. you know each their t shirts and you know, and everything and their look. Yeah, I think it all fit. So. And they they did comment on that whole idea in the film. I think one of them I think one of them asked Eric if he regretted the last three years, and he's like, no. Um, it kind of what's happening now happened because of what happened then, basically. And then I think he says something about how you know it's like, you know, the original films. They, yeah, it's or it might have been like. One of them said this little speech about how they had, like, maybe it's poor CGI and the puppets and all that. But, you know, you love it warts and all. You know, you enjoy for what it is and not, you know. Um, and I, I think I made that point in our Star Wars discussion that that's one of the reasons why the older trilogy is growing on me. Maybe one of the reasons I didn't like it as much at first was because of how cheesy it was, but now I'm kind of like, it's growing on me, you know? Um, because because it's, it's got its own charm. Um, but Dustin, you look like you're about to say something. No, I was just going to say, I mean, because this is just like a standard, like kind of comedy, like there's really like no effects or anything to really critique the protection on. It's like, you know, how was the production on this movie with no effects? It's like, eh, it was fine. They pointed the camera the right way. <laughs> they did do that. Um, well, I mean, production value... In shots. Hmm? And production value also does still have some other things like set design, costuming, makeup, you mm -hmm. know, all of that. We've got that uh, that secret room in, in, the, in the ranch where Lucas has all his treasures. That was kind of a fun little thing. That was cool. Um, yeah. I assume they just went there and did it. Yeah, could be. I mean, you never know. It's like said, which would make it even weirder that Lucas yeah, didn't show up if he gave permission for that. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, and I'll just go ahead and mention real quick again, I had not really paid attention to the Ernest Klein connection until we started this discussion. Uh, have any of y'all read Ready Player One? I have heard very uh, not encouraging me to do that thing. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, okay. I really, really enjoyed the novel. The movie, yeah. it's a good, fun Spielberg popcorn flick, but it really doesn't quite get the the same feel across, I think. Um, and the second book was wholly unnecessary and not as fun as the first. But, <laughs> but really, again, if you're talking about like fandom and people like that really want to geek out over particular things, it was a fun, it was a fun one. Um, and I can, now that I'm aware that he had co-written this, I'm like, oh, it makes so much sense. And it's yet another reason I need to check out the Goldbergs. I've been meaning to, and I just haven't gotten to it, but you know, uh, for the other writer as well. Um, but anyway, uh, let's go ahead and do uh, favorites. And I guess for this one, um, let's do... Um, favorite line if you have one. Uh, favorite character, um, or if you want to do favorite cameo, if you didn't really have like a standout character, but you want to mention a cameo. Um, and then just for fun, like what would be of the movies about fandom, about being, uh, 
really into something probably more than most people would be. What would you say is probably your favorite? Um, well, I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to go first. Go uh, for it. So I think my favorite scene is just one of the arguments with the Star Trek nerds, <laughs> where like it gets it gets like really petty really quickly, and it's like, oh yeah, well, Captain Picard is gay. It's like, he's not gay. He's British, and like just kind of going with the flow of the scene in my mind, I was like, well, what's the difference? Right. I was just kind of like, Dustin, really? Come on. <laughs> like, I felt a little embarrassed, but it was like, it was kind of snapping back into that really old, old headspace from like arguments with that, like in like middle school when things like that were maybe okay to say. Yeah. So that's something I think maybe didn't age too well. Some of the language is kind of like not acceptable today. So even though it was like only 2009, that, that was something that kind of bugged me a little bit about this. But um, yeah, I, I enjoyed that because it was kind of it was kind of nostalgic for like the arguments I used to have with people over Star Trek because Star Trek does suck. It is boring. Like, yeah. <laughs> but um, at any rate, uh, so as for fandom movies, uh, I think I would have to go with, I don't know if it really counts, but the In Search of Darkness movies, uh, the horror documentaries are pretty great. And it's a lot of fun uh, seeing a bunch of people's different memories. Like it's not like a weird like comedy narrative, but it is uh, it is about fandom and it's a fun time. So Versus award winner. Good deal. Yeah. I still need to, s but there are long movies. There are like four hours a piece and there yeah. are three of them. So. Oh yeah, yeah. And, they and all might the sci-fi cool ones. What's that? <laughs> there's the one. There's the sci-fi one in Search of Tomorrow, and then they okay. have the one that they're doing about first-person shooters, okay. and they're making the In Search of Tomorrow a trilogy, and they're planning on doing another horror trilogy about I think the early two th the nineties, I believe. That would be cool. Because I was alive in the nineties, but I was not paying attention. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. uh, that's what. I actually had a brief conversation with some of the people behind the film and they were talking Ooh. about like, oh, you like this. You should wait until you see the ones, the one we're planning on for the 90s. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good times. All right. And then D Dustin, did you give a favorite character or a favorite uh, cameo or what have you? Maybe Billy D. Williams because it was the first moment I was like, hey, he's, he's there. All right. So Trent, come Good on. Deal. Rude. <laughs> All right. And I guess I'll move to the Can lobby. I go? I have a quote. <laughs> oh, okay. Go for it. Because I want to do it before I get, forget it. Uh, okay. Where uh, Kevin Smith is doing that scene and uh, Jason Muse runs out. It's like, I'm not doing this shit again. And he looks at the guys like, well, I tell you, sweet and womanly. <laughs> <laughs> just I don't know why. But every time I saw it, it just cracked me up. <laughs> Jason was like, sweet moly, what the fuck? <laughs> that was just great. <laughs> Good times. And I as far as favorite scenes, I just I like the whole uh Lucas uh, vault. As far as fandom movies, because I'm really not I really don't consider myself a mega fan for anything these days. I mean, maybe B movies uh, for some reason, but um, I would say actually a movie that's fun, even though I, and I know a few of them, but I don't really, I can't really get into it is the uh, movie Bronies, which <laughs> uh, goes into the Brony community. And I, I will, I will say that, I have nothing against that community, but I am. I do. But I don't really understand the love for that series overall. I watched the first series because of a uh, of a person saying this is one of the best animated series ever, so they made us watch the first season. And several of my of our gaming group really loved the series, and I was and like, we all got low level diabetes just from watching. Yeah, that was basically <laughs> how I was left feeling it by the end of it. I was like, it was well done, but it's a bit too 
too uh, sugary for my taste. It's all about psychosexual perversion, really. Uh, see, and I think that's the wrong. I really do feel that that's the wrong way to take it. That's that's really uh, what. <laughs> that's real. Actually, I could say that is what a lot of people try to. A lot of people try to paint these people in without knowing them, and a lot of these people are they just more like the creativity and the uh, and the kind of what's the word. Um, I it. guess the optim optimism of it, because that's okay. something that you don't really get. So I can understand. It's not. Yes, you have perverts and everything. You have perverts in this Star Wars thing, <laughs> which is just right. Bad. It's just uh, you know, but well, it's it's after. cool to watch. But yeah, I would still suggest anybody should uh, oh, just watch the Bronies it. documentary because it is a it's a fun documentary, very well made. And it's just kind of cool to look at it from that perspective because that community is not much different than, say, the Star Wars or Trekkie community and, you know, Trekkies as well. That's that's a classic. So I think I may have actually seen that uh, at some point when I was kind of like, like, what is this about? Because people were talking about it. Um, I did see a documentary on the last, like, convention they tried to have where it just kind of went. That's like the original <laughs> that's like the original like fandom movie well, my, um, I used to go to a lot of anime conventions before I was able to find any good horror conventions and I remember though, meeting some of these people and it was it was a dude in Artist Alley with like his table and the guy wasn't there but I was looking at the table and there were some there were things that had like black bars like taped to you know censor some of the My Little Pony art and I was looking at it kind of disturbed and the guy I was like, damn, why do they do it? And like somebody hears me like there, and the guy is under the table, like hidden behind like the tablecloth. He puts his head out and he's like, oh, hey, you know, I got a customer, I guess. Hey, you know, and he, he like crawls out from under the table. Like he looks not showered, let's just say. He's like, so you like the ponies, huh? <laughs> and it's like, no. What? <laughs> Why do you do it? Oh, well, that's, uh, <laughs> that's almost it. every fandom has these weird rule 34 communities and artists that do but it. Not 50% of the community? No, I don't think it's 50% of any community. That uh, could traumatize me. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd say that they're probably about 10% of any community. Star Wars, Star Trek, uh, My right. Little Pony, uh, if it it's exists, just, there is porn of it. Now, I say there's some exceptions, like maybe Hellraiser, because they're all kinky into that stuff. <laughs> that's what that's about. <laughs> but you know, otherwise, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. About different cartoons. Usually, it's not like the thing people wear on their sleeve. Usually, you suppress that shit instead of being like, "No, I like this for this reason." It's like, okay, you're weird. Hmm. Uh, uh, Dave is trying to get back. Yeah. I but I did. I do think that the, that the, those documentaries are good. You have to give it a watch to really, uh, truly get a good idea as to certain types of fandom. Because there's always going to be dark sides of all fandom. <sighs> and I've been to anime conventions, right. and, and trust me, then that's that sort of dark seediness is in a lot of places. Usually in the uh, usually in the those sections of the cons where you have like the independent artists at, <laughs> hmm. and uh, the they like to uh, cater their art to others, right? Um, and I've seen some dis disturbing things at Anime Mid Atlantic uh, <laughs> before my little boy. <laughs> Oh, yeah. the things people people just love to love to see those types of things. <laughs> so uh, I will give this maybe some more credit. Like the costumes they had were pretty good. Like the um, like the Star Wars costumes themselves, like they were very good quality. Like right. the two people that guys at the end, like their stuff looked great. Hey, if if somebody walked into the Halloween party, uh, like the two stormtroopers uh, flanking Darth Vader going in. I'd have mm -hmm. thought that was cool. 
<laughs> right. Because those are pretty good costumes right there. Yeah. For just a bunch of people coming to a Halloween party. And I'll admit, Zoe's outfit amused me too. I, it was uh, it was a it was a nice little joke she had going. The <laughs> oh, I mean, blue period. The blue period, yes. <laughs> but at any rate, um, so Brandon, you you mentioned uh, the cameo uh, with Muse and and Smith as your favorite line. Was that was that your favorite cameo in the film? Or? Uh it was between Smith and uh, Shatner. Ah, just yeah. because it just amused the first time I saw it. Yeah. It amused it was... the heck out of me when you had Shatner appearing. And then later in the movie, right. when Lucas is on the phone, is like, was it Shatner? <laughs> was like... right. Not to mention Shatner just played it so deadpan. Like one of my favorite lines in the movie was, um, I'm William Shatner. I could score anything. <laughs> it's like, we got Dave you know. back. What's that? We got Dave back. <laughs> Yay. All right. Um, so, Dave, do you want to go next to uh, give your favorites? Are you with us, Dave? Well, maybe he's partially back. Oh, uh, okay. Well, while, while they're getting fired up, I guess I'll go ahead and go. Um, I think that one line I just mentioned from Shatner was one of my favorite lines. And I love the part, again, where Danny where Danny McBride is like, I have been informed <laughs> you know, that my opinion has changed. You know, like, <laughs> I, I, being the dutiful employee that he was, uh, I found that quite amusing. But um, Okay, sorry. I, I like to... What's up? Sorry about that. I was... Uh... I'm sorry. Just try, uh, trying to sign into my uh, my phone. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, well, uh, so uh, you, uh, my thing was since you when, away, when, and... um, What's when William Shatner showed up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you might as well finish yours since you got started, Jacob. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and do that, and then Dave will we'll get to you. Um, uh, I'm going to say I do actually have a favorite character, um, and although maybe partly because I really like Kristen Bell as an actress, but I really did like Zoe as a character, and Windows was probably my second favorite of the main cast, but, you know, Windows and Hutch were a really fun team, uh, but I did like Zoe. Uh, Shatner was my favorite cameo, uh, probably probably Kevin Smith being a second there. Um, as far as a favorite uh and I guess favorite scene might be the one with Shatner. Um, although, again, the one with McBride, yeah, where, as you said, that, that callback to Shatner yeah. was great. Um, either, evidently, because they're not hearing you. They keep talking. So that, Whenever you say what's up? Something. The, uh, and as far as movies about fandom, I think I am going to go with Almost Famous, because I think that is kind of, <laughs> maybe would kind of fit into that vein uh you got groupies and you got the main character who really is a fan of the people he's covering um and it's, it's good times and we've lost them again lovely uh <laughs> i wonder what's going on but yeah the uh the force was not strong with them apparently not rough um, well I will say this, just so that by the time Dave and them get back, I'll need to be getting off the air. Okay. Um, because I really need to get going soon. But uh, my uh, my thought on, on uh, as far as next week, we're also okay. going to be covering uh, the Adventures of Baron Munchausen. So just as a heads up on that. <laughs> and uh, I, I really don't have anything to say about my channel, so outros wouldn't be much for me anyway. <laughs> Uh, I'm still trying to come back to making stuff. Like I'm kind of, I'm closer to being out of the hole to where I can actually do that again. But I'm mm -hmm. still, still quite deep in it. So uh, I don't really have that much to plug either, except you know, subscribe to the Crypt of Horrors, find Crypt, your Crypt Access on Twitter and Blue Sky. That's all, all right. I got. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, we do. Um, we've got. We are doing our discussion on Cromartie High tomorrow, right? Is that? Yeah, that's, that's supposed okay. to be. Okay, so we'll be doing Cromartie High School, uh, or Sakagake Cromartie Gakuen, I think it was, on uh, on uh, Septum Sin versus the World. That'll be tomorrow night. Yep, uh, it's good times. Um, where are we at, Dave? <laughs> Dave, are you there? Yeah. But, um, hmm. We all, anyone else here have any additional thoughts on this one? We all uh, pretty much said, okay. said our pieces, I guess. Uh, Dave says that his favorite character is Hutch. Favorite okay. scene is when William Shatner shows up, and the other cameo is his favorite cameo is also William Shatner. Okay. Just in case he can't get his internet to work. Okay. Yeah, I'm William Shatner. I can get anything is actually probably true. I, I did it. I will admit I did appreciate that because it's like, yeah, I mean, right. I'm sure he would have people he could call to give him whatever. Right. Tammy's is Hutch. And the scene when they're trying to outrun the cops and they're freaking out. Okay. Good deal. And favorite cameo is also William Shatner. <laughs> yep. I, I don't even like William Shatner all that much, but I have to admit, he schooled it there. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> he did. <laughs> the, right. man, the man has a way. It's just sort of like how when he played uh, General Mortars in uh, Loaded Weapon, he was such a fun villain in that. He has a way, especially of making fun of when he's making fun of himself or he's being over the top serious. Mm -hmm. He's hilarious. When he's just trying to be serious and act regularly, not so much. <laughs> Let's see, fan right. obsession movie, Galaxy Quest. Oh, that's a good one. The best oh. Star Trek movie there is. I still say that, like, unironically. Like, I think it's legit, like, better than any of the Star Trek movies I've seen, which, granted, I've only seen, I want to say, two or three, but still. Never give up. Never surrender. Indeed. <laughs> Galaxy Quest is one that we need to cover eventually. That was a good... Uh... Uh uh, since Dave can't get online, uh, I guess since I actually do still have control over this, I can mm -hmm. end us. But is there anything else any of y'all wanted to say before we close uh, that? No, I think we probably covered it. Um, hopefully, uh, sorry, Dave and Tammy had that last minute, you know, right at the last minute, you know. <laughs> Well, check out Inside Movies Galore and Delusions of Grandeur. They keep doing these things and rolling them out and having some good discussions. Oh, yeah, and check out Schlockaholics as well. I forgot. I keep forgetting to, to put that channel out there because I'm more active on that one than I am on my own channel. We'll be covering a lot of fan... We'll be covering a lot of short films from Matrosia who are... Known for the film Snow Shark. For oh, those of you talks. who like the low Ooh. budget film uh, of uh, old. <laughs> and a couple things uh, regarding our channel, too. Um, one, we basically de decided end of July will be the cutoff point for Versus Award nominees. So anyone interested in that, it will be the end of July. Yep. All you have to do is watch uh, 12 films from 2022. Yes. If you can watch 12 of them, you will be able to fill up enough categories to do at least the half needed to uh, submit. Right. We need at least 12 solid Best Picture nominees and as many as you can where you can fill up a field of six. Uh, although, like I said, I don't really care if you just do five. Just keep in mind you won't get the six point for your top pick. Uh, <laughs> the other um, the other thing is, uh, did you want to do a plug yet for the, uh, the, the, the influential movie thing? Or do you? Well, we're going to try and get some content done either next week or the week after. 
just depending on how our research into our current um, filming of uh, tabletop horror goes, um, mm -hmm. we realized that the film that we were trying to watch was way too long to get our research done. So we're having to split it up in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. It's a nice Chilean film called Eternal Blood. Mm -hmm. uh, or Sangra Eternal, <laughs> mm -hmm. which uh, is uh, a vampire film about vampire players who end up, uh, uh, well, falling in with real vampires. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, you know, I've seen it already once. Not my favorite film, but um, when... I'm doing these, uh, we're doing these episodes where we're trying to just cover any film that has anything to do with tabletop or LARPing. And this one definitely does cover that. Mm -hmm. So that'll be our fifth episode of 44 episodes we have to film. <laughs> and then once those are filmed, then we might actually debut them on the channel. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. All right. So, are we uh, going to call it then? Yep. So, have fun. Subscribe. Share. Yeah. Like. Go to all the channels. Look below. All of those channels that are below, you mm -hmm. subscribe to them all. I mean it. All of them. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. And we'll see you guys on the next episode where we discuss Baron Munchausen. May the force be with you. <laughs> and, you know, all that.